Hello, I'm Dr. Algarni. Uh, I'm a consultant cardiac surgeon at Johns Hopkins uh, Aramco Healthcare. And uh, I will talk today about um, surgery for heart valve diseases uh, for the World Heart Day uh, uh, 2021. So we start first by um, explaining uh, a very uh, basic anatomy of the heart. So the heart basically has four chambers and four valves. The right atrium and the left atrium are the upper chambers of the heart and the right ventricle and the left ventricle are the lower chambers of the heart. And these are the main, the main pumping chambers of the heart. And uh, there are four valves, aortic valve, mitral valve, tricuspid and pulmonary valve. So basically the function of the atria which is the right atrium and the left atrium is to receive the blood while the function of the ventricles is to pump the blood. So um, what happened basically is that a blood that has a very low oxygen returns from the body through the right superior vena cava and through the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava and goes to the right atrium, which is the right uh, upper chamber here. And that blood flow through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. And the right ventricle bumps that blood through the pulmonary valve to the pulmonary arteries to go to the lung and then get oxygen from the lung. And the oxygenated blood comes back to the left upper chamber of the heart, which is the left atrium. And then through a mitral valve, that oxygenated blood flows to the left ventricle which is the main pumping chamber of the heart, which pumps the blood to all the body through the aortic valve. Now, any one of these valves can be affected by the disease process. Now, um, the uh, tricuspid valve, the pulmonary valve, uh, aortic valve, and mitral valve, uh, any one of those valves are usually affected by uh, two pathologies, either narrowing and we call that stenosis or a leak which is called regurgitation the most common valves that we see in saudi arabia are the um, mitral and aortic valve and the most common cause uh, in saudi arabia is rheumatic, is rheumatic heart disease now um, as we talked in the previous slide that there are multiple uh, pathologies that can lead to uh, valve disease, and in Saudi Arabia, the most common is, uh, is uh, rheumatic heart disease, and this usually leads to um, uh, uh, thickening and calcification of the leaflets of the valve and leads to uh, mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation combined with mitral stenosis, and the same thing can also happen to the um, other valves of the heart, especially the uh, aortic valve. And this condition, the uh, rheumatic heart disease, is, um, uh, is a consequence of a previous uh, uh, infection um, with the group A streptococcus, which leads to um, uh, a condition called uh, group A streptococcus pharyngitis. Um, a small percentage of those patients can develop uh, heart disease in the future. And it's very critical that um, a bacterial um, sore throat that is caused by streptococcus is um, um, treated aggressively with antibiotics to prevent uh, such complication. Now, these are the two common pathologies that can affect the mitral valve. The first one is mitral valve regurgitation. So what happened in this condition is that when the left ventricle, which is the main pumping chamber of the heart, when the ventricle contract to push the blood through the aorta to the rest of the body, with the presence of leak or regurgitation in the mitral valve, part of that blood goes back to the lungs through the left atrium. So that creates a pressure overload and volume overload on the uh, left side of the heart. And um, if that is not treated, um, uh, it can lead to, with time, to dilatation or enlargement of the um, uh, left, upper, and lower chambers of the heart. And uh, if it is not treated for an extended period of time, it can lead to 
even weakness of the ventricular muscle and then it can result into heart failure. So patients who have a significant or severe mitral regurgitation requires a very close attention and um, uh, usually most of those, of, the, of those patients will require uh, surgery to correct the mitral valve regurgitation. Now, the other pathology on the um, left side here is uh, mitral stenosis or uh, mitral narrowing, which is a narrowing of the mitral valve uh, that doesn't really allow uh, the blood to flow easily from the left uh, atrium to the left ventricle. And what that results in, it results in to increase in the pressure <clears throat> and volume on the left atrium and therefore increase in the pressure in the uh, pulmonary arteries and, um, uh, and that leads, uh, if it's uh, untreated for a long time, to um, um, pulmonary hypertension or raised blood pressure in the pulmonary arteries. And um, um, uh, patients usually develop symptoms like shortness of breath and uh, most of uh, these pathologies, if they become severe, so if you develop a severe mitral stenosis, um, most of those patients will be eventually um, requiring a mitral valve replacement um, uh, to relieve that obstruction between the left atrium and the left ventricle. Now, this is the uh, normal anatomy uh, of the valve. Unfortunately, the video is not running here. But uh, basically, the mitral valve has two leaflets, an anterior leaflet and a posterior leaflet. And if you imagine yourself uh, really sitting in the left atrium and looking downwards, the blood flows from the left atrium to the left ventricle through this mitral valve. And when the ventricle contracts, this mitral valve should close and prevent any regurgitation. Um, uh, again, this is um, an echocardiogram on ultrasound of the heart, which take a slice of the heart and shows the four chambers of the heart, the right atrium, the right ventricle, the left atrium, and the left ventricle. And the arrow here points to the mitral valve, which separates the left atrium from the left ventricle. So uh, we talked about mitral uh, valve pathology. The second uh, valve that is commonly uh, affected is the aortic valve. Uh, and the most common pathology that affects the aortic valve is uh, uh, aortic stenosis, which is basically a narrowing of the aortic valve. So calcium deposits uh, accumulates on the leaflets of the aortic valve, and that results into um, uh, significant narrowing of the valve. And therefore, the uh, left ventricle has to really squeeze hard to get that blood ejected through the narrowed valve. So you can see here in the image the normal valve has really a wide, um, uh, wide opening that allows smooth uh, flow of the blood from the left ventricle to the aorta. Um, and then when the uh, aortic valve starts to narrow, you develop mild and then moderate and then severe stenosis. And that is really similar to, you know, the, um, the, garden, the garden hose that you have. So if you put a nozzle on the hose that you have in your garden, the smaller the nozzle, the more pressure that you have on the uh, on the inside the hose, uh, and the more difficult for the for the water to comes out. So basically, with aortic stenosis, the uh, heart really generates a lot of pressure to uh, to be able to um, uh, uh, push the blood uh, to the aorta through the narrowed valve. So those patients who have severe aortic stenosis um, eventually requires an intervention to replace uh, the aortic valve. Um, a similar pathology can happen also, which is aortic regurgitation. Instead of the narrowing, what happens is that the blood leaks back into the left ventricle, and over time, this leads to uh, increasing in the size of the uh, left ventricle, and eventually it can lead to uh, weakness of the ventricle and then heart failure. So both aortic stenosis and aortic regurgitation requires a very close attention by your doctors. Now, uh, how do you know that you may have heart valve disease? Now, common signs and symptoms of heart valve disease includes the following, shortness of breath, especially with activity, fatigue, again, during activity, um, uh, palpitations, which is basically a sensation of rapid uh, heartbeats, um, chest pain uh, can be a presenting symptoms of some of the uh, 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 heart valve diseases, Dizziness, fainting, or even loss of consciousness can happen with certain valve diseases, 
like severe or critical aortic stenosis. And some patients also um, at a final stage of uh, valve heart disease can develop swollen feet or legs. So if you have any of the above signs or symptoms, you, uh, uh, you require to see your doctor for more investigations. Now, how do we diagnose the heart valve disease? Usually the diagnosis starts by taking a careful history and physical examination. By your doctor, and then we do some blood tests, um, electrocardiogram or ECG, chest X ray, and then ultrasound of the heart or echocardiography. And if needed, uh, more investigations like MRI or heart cath can be done. And the treatment uh, is usually started with medical therapy, and in some patients, um, uh, cardiac uh, intervention, either with uh, a catheter based or with open heart surgery, uh, are required in many patients. Now, we will talk uh, simply about the open heart surgery to uh, treat uh, uh, heart valve diseases. The most commonly way to perform heart surgery is through um, uh, a full sternotomy, which is basically an incision that is uh, done through the breast bone. This is usually a big incision. It's a large operation. And this is the, you know, the, um, uh, the old fashion of doing uh, valve surgery for aortic and mitral valve diseases. Uh, nowadays, we uh, increasingly use more minimally invasive techniques. So the same procedure can be performed through a small incisions that uh, can be done between the ribs in the right side of the chest, or sometimes a small incision about five centimeters that is done uh, anteriorly uh, in the sternum. And the minimally invasive um, surgery is associated with uh, a lot of advantages compared to the standard um, uh, uh, standard uh, full sternotomy approach. Now, uh, this is again um, a picture that shows the difference between the two procedures, the full sternotomy and the uh, minimally invasive procedure through a small thoracotomy, which is a small incision between the ribs and the right side of the chest. There are a lot of advantages. Um, in performing the surgery through a minimally invasive approach uh, compared to the um, uh, sternotomy. And we always recommend that um, patients um, uh, try to get a referral to a center that is specialized in doing um, the minimally invasive procedure. We, um, I strongly recommend that any patients have uh, mitral valve disease or aortic valve disease that they are screened um, for potential minimally invasive surgery instead of the standard approach uh, due to the many advantages that are associated with the minimally invasive surgery compared to the full sternotomy. And most patients are actually a candidate for minimally invasive valve surgery, whether it's a mitral valve or uh, aortic valve or even a tricuspid valve. Now, once we, um, once the patient is, is referred to us uh, with a diagnosis of um, um, uh, of uh, valve disease, uh, then we determine which uh, pathology the patient has. For example, this patient has a, a mitral valve uh, disease uh, in which um, there is a regurgitation or a leak of the mitral valve due to um, a prolapsed segment of the posterior leaflet of the mitral valve. Uh, in a cases like this, um, most uh, patients get a mitral valve repair, which we always recommend and we always prefer uh, over a mitral valve replacement. And this is achievable in nearly 98, 99% of the patients if they have a simple um, uh, prolapse of the posterior leaflet. Uh, that part that is prolapsing gets resected and then the two edges are sewn back together and an aneuroblasty band is inserted and um, uh, the surgery is usually completed through a, um, a small thoracotomy, doing it in a minimally invasive fashion and patients usually leave the hospital within four to five days, and they can go back to full activity within two weeks. Now, uh, patients who have an aortic valve disease, um, especially aortic stenosis, the most commonly operation that we perform is aortic valve replacement. So we basically resect the diseased valve and we replace it with a, a prosthetic valve. And there are two types of prosthetic valve. There's a tissue valve and a mechanical valve. Each one of them uh, has pros and cons that we usually discuss with the patients before surgery. The factors that affects uh, the decision of choosing tissue or mechanical valves are many. Um, this includes the age, um, 
planning of pregnancy, uh, presence of contraindications for blood thinners, lifestyle of the patient, the work type, etc. So um, each type of these uh, valves has pros and cons, but simply the difference is that mechanical valve is kind of a permanent valve that doesn't that doesn't degenerate with time. But the problem of mechanical valve is that they require anticoagulation for life. Um, on the other hand, tissue valves, they don't require anticoagulation um, except for a few months after surgery. And then usually the anticoagulation can be stopped after that if there are no other indications for their use. However, the limitations of the tissue valve is that they can, uh, they have tear and wear with time, so they can degenerate um, uh, with time. Now, the choice of which valve, as I said, is um, uh, dependent on multiple factors that has to be discussed with the patient before surgery. Now, uh, this is uh, a case of um, minimally invasive mitral valve surgery uh, that I did for a patient um, who's a young patient, has uh, a severe mitral regurgitation. Um, and usually the approach that we use um, uh, is, uh, this is a patient lying down here, the head is here, and the feet are below, and this is the right side of the chest, and we usually perform it through um, um, a four to five uh, centimeter incision made in the right fourth intercostal space, and then uh, the um, uh, procedure is uh, completed, um, uh, whether it's a repair of the mitral valve or a replacement. The patients usually um, uh, wake up very early after surgery. They um, leave the ICU usually within one day, and uh, they leave the hospital within four to five days, and they can uh, uh, come back to full activity uh, in about uh, two weeks. Thank you very much.